2016 webinar series. Uh, today's webinar is entitled Parks for the People, Equitable, De Equitable Development and Urban Parks. This is our second this year. Uh, and today's webinar will focus on how cities can address the need for accessibility to parks and green space in the face of rising real estate values. Panelists from Detroit and San Antonio will discuss how their cities work with developers to ensure that adequate, affordable housing is provided as part of construction projects that create and sustain adequate park access at the same time. My name is Kathy Blaha. I'm one of the co-chairs of the City Parks Alliance Board, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Uh, I think we all know that parks are great catalysts for neighborhood change, but not all of those changes are positive. Investment in new and existing parks raises the value of surrounding real estate, which may cause uh, increases in commercial and residential rents and may cause displacement. Uh, so part of what we'll talk about today is how cities can address the need for increasing amounts of accessible green space while keeping homes affordable. Uh, webinar panelists will present case studies from the Hemisphere Park Area Redevelopment Corporation in San Antonio, Texas and from the Detroit Parks and Recreation Department to highlight strategies they're using for mitigating displacement caused by gentrification, but as important ensuring equitable access by city residents to the benefits of new and renovated parks. Two tools that I'll be talking about in particular are the use of community benefit agreements and the creation of public benefit corporations. So Alicia Bradford is our first speaker. Alicia was appointed the uh, Director of Parks and Recreation in Detroit in June of 2010. As Director, she oversees policy establishment and implementation, advocacy, budget development, operations, and administration of the department. Prior to, prior to being appointed as Director, she served as the Deputy Director in 2008 and has been in city government for over 25 years. In this capacity, she directs 215 professional employees in the areas of customer service, programming, employee development, and budgeting. She has served as general manager for operations and Belle Isle Park Manager since her return to the Park and Recreation Department in 2001. Her expertise includes budgeting, performance management, public private partnerships, organizational employee development, and human resources. She is respected as a leader in the field of recreation and management. She earned her bachelor's degree in political science and public administration from Wayne State, is a member of Pi Sigma Alpha, Political Science National Honor Society, and she's affiliated with the Michigan Rec Recreation Parks Association, the National Recreation Parks Association, chair of the Detroit, chair elect of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, Eastern Market Corporation, the Northwest Activities Program, and the Bell Isle Advisory Board. Following Alicia, We'll hear from Andre Underhar, CEO of the Hemisphere Park Area Redevelopment Corporation in San Antonio. Andre was named CEO of the Hemisphere Park Area Redevelopment Corporation in 2011. He is now driving the vision for the Hemisphere Area Redevelopment, which is a plan to just transform the 1968 World Fair site into an urban district with multiple parks, residents, and local businesses. Hemisphere is gradually becoming sustainable, self-funded, and filled with events authentic to San Antonio. It will be a vibrant gathering place for everything from a day with friends to the city's biggest celebrations. In addition to his work on the Hemisphere District, Andres helped develop a vision and coined River North for an area north of the San Antonio downtown surrounding the museum reach of the Riverwalk extension that resulted in the 400-acre urban rezoning and creation of a tax Incremental Investment Zone. For that volunteer effort, Andres was given an honorary title from the American Institute of Architects. He was named 2006 Downtowner of the Year by Downtown Alliance and selected as one of San Antonio's visionaries in 2008. Andre got his bachelor's degree in architectural engineering from the University of Texas at Austin in 1980, and his career includes design, construction, development, and management experience of several billion dollars worth of projects around the U.S. and abroad. We're going to hear from both speakers today uh, first, and then after the presentations, we'll move into the Q&A session. We have a good crowd once again on today's call, and so in order to make sure we can try to respond to all of your questions, 
um, or problems as they arise. Here's a few tips. In order to ask a question, please use your ask a question option that you'll see in the box, probably on the right hand of the screen, instead of raising your hand. So if you type the question in the box, click send. You may send us questions throughout the presentations, uh, both for Alicia and Andre, but we're going to hold all the questions until they're both finished with their presentations. If you experience any technical issues during the presentation, also type that into the question box and send it to us. Uh, we'll try to take care of it as soon as we can. If you miss them, don't worry. Uh, downloaded links uh, to the PDF and the Windows media files for today's webinar will be emailed to you after the presentation. So I think we're ready to get started. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Alicia. All right. Thank you so much, Kathy, and thank you all that are listening. Um, and thank you to the City Parks Alliance for inviting me. Just to lay out a footprint of the City of Detroit Parks and Recreation Department, we manage 306 parks, which is about 5,200 uh, acres um, across the city. And we offer a variety of amenities for the neighborhood and surrounding community. And many of these parks were created and designed over 80 years ago when the population of the city was much larger and, and use of the green space was utilized more for passive recreation than in comparison to the last few decades, on um, which we become more active. And also some aspect has changed, um, our decline in population, our demographics, um, the needs for parks as a gathering place has not. Um, and as a resurgence of bankruptcy, um, we're seeing a transference on more of the social equity uh, being requested from our community and from our residents in order to improve their neighborhood and through, through that, through the stabilization of parks. Next slide, please. This is a photo of yesteryear showing a passive youth, um, some athletic of our parks. Next slide, please. But as we go, again, moving forward with decade, we're using it more as athletic fields, um, some for passive recreation, walking, and other amenities that I'm sure a number of you that are dealing with parks or head of park agencies are handling within your own community. Now, the city has experienced an increase in park use and requests to develop on and around our existing green spaces. And this has really been an uptick since the resurgence of our bankruptcy. Um, the City of Detroit City Council uh, created an ordinance to support community benefits agreement and for project development in the city. And especially if the developer is receiving a tax abatement, utilizing any aspect of our city funds, general funds, uh, community development, black grant funds to support the development or if the project adversely affects a neighborhood, being displacement of parks, or again, as Kathy indicated, the rising cost of housing development, which displace individuals out of their residence or neighborhood. This has been the main focus of both the City of Detroit Parks and Recreation Department and the Planning Development Department in discussions with developers and the importance of having community engagement. The interest of the community plays a significant role as decisions are made on potential projects. And I want to discuss two major projects that acted as a catalyst to formalize the community benefits agreement for the city, through our city council, and the community as well. And that's our Detroit Stadium District and Detroit River International Bridge. Next slide, please. So both of these projects, again, um, acquired or amassed um, some park space that were under the purview of the City of Detroit Parks and Recreation Department. Um, and in it, um, there was a level of displacement of housing, but as well as green space and the accessibility for the community to be able to utilize that. Um, and so the Detroit Stadium District is a new district stadium um, that will take place really of our Ford Field and our Comerica Park um, and will create nearly a 50 block development. And in that, they acquired our four acre park, which is known as Cass Park. And that park was really a major hub for the community um, to enjoy concerts, um, passive recreation, walking, just um, and sitting by on a bench reading. So that was a major component within that neighborhood. So of course there was issue about this development proposal, which is well over $450 million to come into the city, but still ret retaining the asset. So the investment of the district not only it includes not only the stadium, the residential, retail, parking, and park at parks to enhance the community. So although it's displacing a four-acre park, 
some of the drive from the community benefits agreement and the community engagement was to assure that there is mixed housing, mixed uh, economic residential. So there are certain percentage that is held for low income or moderately income as well. And then that just shows the footprint of the stadium district. So you see that we have a new arena area, Cass Park area, which is where the existing Cass Park is, and they're creating a new Cass Park and then developing other pocket parks around the central 50 block district in order to be able to accommodate the community needs. Now, unfortunately, this um, particular project was approved without having the community benefits agreement basically uh, codified. However, they were able to still negotiate the community being vocal to city council, being able to negotiate some of the requests or needs that they, uh, they wanted to see within their community that would benefit them in the long run and not just the developer. Next slide, please. And this is just showing the arena district on a larger scale as well, where it is where it's incorporating on a new district area. And again, where they're displacing of housing. Um, there's um, historical hotels that were involved in this whole transaction. So as you can imagine, it was a discussion that took place well over a year and a half to basically get to a final agreement. It was a, a lot of heated debate. But again, I think um, the community was able to achieve some of the requests that they wanted. Um, but not all, but it was just a learning lesson of moving forward for us all and what we need to do on the forefront of getting the community online and discuss those benefits with the developers on the forefront. Next slide, please. And the next project is Detroit River International Bridge, um, also known as the Gordy Howe Bridge. I don't know how many hockey followers we have on here, but named after a former hockey player with Detroit Red Wings. So this has been proposed by the Michigan Department of Transportation in the state of Michigan, which is a $5 billion project. And actually, this project has been in discussion for the last seven years. And it's now uh, to approval from the state and funding um, is being identified in place. But the new bridge construction will impact um, some key park property that we have within the city. And one is a historic Fort Wayne, which was a military fort that was actually deployment for um, uh, branches of service and induction of um, citizens um, into the United States. And so the impact, and we did an environmental assessment um, studies and also community impact studies um, from MDOT um, for Fort Wayne and for South Redemaker and Jefferson Post play lot, which will be displacing um, the two play lots and will have some significant impact to historic Fort Wayne um, as far as um, traffic, um, vibrations from vehicles, um, the load of the bridge, and also displacing the residents as we build a new plaza uh, for the riverfront uh, crossing. So again, it was all the engagement of the community in determining how this will be facilitated, what will be the benefit, and again, making sure that they receive the best possible, in, best possible amenities from this deal. So again, it included residents of the community having a more active participatory role in determining the benefits for their neighborhood before a final deal was made. And so we're still in that negotiation conversation, much different from the stadium district, which was private developer. This requires state funds, state approval, so there are other layers of engagement that's required for them to do in order to reach a consensus to move ahead with this project. Next slide, please. And what it is just showing the proposed bridge, bridge project. So we have an existing ambassador bridge. This is additional bridge to um, allow for trade and additional vehicle traffic um, moving across from Detroit to um, Canada as well. And so you can see on the map where we have Fort Wayne, which is along the river, and then moving further um, toward the west from where the river is, we see um, there are parks that are identified in there that is South Redemaker and Jefferson Play Lot. So the bridge is impacting well into the community. You can see residential there as well. And so again, we had to do further engagement. This has been a process for seven years in order to basically streamline um, and to hear the community on how they would like this project to come forward and what they'd like to see that would happen besides economic benefits for their area residents. Next slide. And so in the community benefits, indeed, they're desired, especially if they can influence the outcome of potential projects 
being approved by the legislative body, and that is our city council here. And the challenge noted from our experience with CBA is who will negotiate on behalf of the community? There's always a lot of voices, but who's the identified voice that will carry out or bring back to those developers or bring back, likewise, to the community the involvement in negotiating those terms for the overall good? And two, if the issues and concerns are not acceptable by all parties, i.e. the developers, the community, the City of Detroit executive and legislative branches, how does this impact the decision approval to move forward? And that has been an issue as well. Um, again, I mentioned the Detroit Stadium District in which the deal was made before community benefits agreement was reached and the ordinance put in place in order to accept that. Um, but does that mean once the ordinance is in place, will that dissuade or um, indicate to individuals they would not like to move or develop in the city because there are a lot of factors that they would have to deal with, which takes me to three. If an agreement is reached, will that discourage future development? Will developers feel frustrated over perceived unrealistic requests or hindrance to the critical or complete critical deadline, deadlines for greater um, financial benefit for the entire community or for themselves as well. So then that would then discourage the economic impact and the benefit that the city would receive overall if maybe these CBAs are put in place or if we have an individual that's speaking on behalf of the community that's, that's on their personal agenda opposed to the community's agenda. And then the fourth, how the requirements or outcomes measure. So how do we hold the developers accountable for those benefits that are put in place? How do we make sure that the things that they've promised in order to have that particular piece of land or park property, whatever the case may be, that that's still maintained and that it's carried out as part of their agreement? Next slide, please. So just some takeaway points um, when you're dealing with community benefits agreement in your um, cities and your municipalities. is One thing is that you have to maintain the public trust and transparency. We hear that word, but you definitely have to provide them with all of the accurate information and basically lay all the cards or the deal information on the table for them to review. And then I know from a lot of the community benefits agreements, they're looking for jobs for individuals in the community. If you're building in that community and that area where they're residing, they'd like for their people to be employed. So in order to have some jobs, to have a longstanding economic opportunity besides just to the developer, but then, of course, they would have income in order to stabilize their homes, which also permeates out into the community. And then, again, having the retention of green space. Um, in the district, um, when they acquired four acres of Cash Park, we were still able to negotiate creating pocket parks along those 50 blocks in order for the community to enjoy. Um, and that should be included in the project proposals here for housing, whatever the developer is, is putting forward for consideration. And then commitment to park improvements and maintenance. To look for that in the CBA, I know amongst a, a lot of cities and municipalities with declining budgets to their parks and recreation department, you would like the developer to engage, to be committed, for the park improvements for 10, 15 year period or for the duration of their agreement for the property and also to assist or support the maintenance in order for it to continue to be a pristine or a premier park or green space for that community. Next slide. So that is in conclusion of my presentation. I thank you for your time and attention and I know we will have questions after my colleague Andreas will speak next. Thank you. Great, thanks, Alicia. Uh, pretty interesting. Um, I know that uh, community benefit agreements are fairly new and there aren't a lot of examples around the country, so what Detroit is doing is, is pretty cutting edge. So, Andre, uh, I think we're ready to hear about what's going on in San Antonio. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today uh, to talk about the uh, most favorite things that we have to talk about, our own projects, and so thank you for, for your interest in, 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 our, in our world. Uh, I want to start with how in San Antonio we came to where we are today with the fair side. The uh, uh, San Antonio had a 1968 World Fair site, very successful, six million people came, over a six month period. Um, but then at conclusion, there were a series of master plans 
but they were not funded. And so it's now 48 years um, since uh, since the fair, and very little has happened uh, until 2009, when then Mayor Castro, now HUD Secretary, um, took interest in in some concepts developed in in, in the community by volunteers to bring new life to the hemisphere site. So um, um, that included the proposal of the creation of a local government corporation, which is created by the municipality, but arms length from that structure. It's governed by, governed by a board of directors that is a volunteer group, and uh, I'll get a little bit more into the structure in a second. But uh, along with the creation of the organization, there were there was some funding brought to the equation, which kicked off uh, the conceptualization and the master plan. The the efforts through the master plan included uh, hundreds of community meetings and thousands of participants. Uh, I was just doing a summary since uh, 2010. We were at about 650 media stories on Hemisphere, and that is averaging about one a week. So the project has public interest, and that helps provide legs for it. Um, in um, 2012, we had concluded the master plan, and uh, we took it to council for their approval, an, an important step in everything we do from the standpoint of authority. Uh, we, we have to have agreements in place, and approvals of master plans is one such agreement. So we have a solid foundation to uh, upon which to execute. Next. So here is a quick summation of, of our organization, starting with the city of San Antonio mayor and council, and following that line of command, the city manager and city staff. Um, we have two organizations to the side, to the sides of the uh, city structure. On the left is a Hemisphere Public Facility Corporation, which is the landowner for the properties in the Hemisphere District. And then on the right in the red box is our organization. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, mayor appointed board. Uh, the, um, I, I report to that board. We have 10 staff at this time. And, uh, and of course, working very closely with the city, every step we take requires council or management approval. And, uh, and so it's a highly synchronized effort, and if you read between the lines, that may also mean that uh, there is all sorts of dangers for miscommunications that you must keep a close eye on, make sure there is no trouble ahead. Um, we also formed a conservancy, the Hemisphere Conservancy, which is exclusively dedicated to fundraising for the purposes of the benefit of the hemisphere parks. Next. When we were created, uh, the Articles of Incorporation included a vision and guiding principles. And we've summed up the vision here. Um, at the end, I won't read the, these because you can read it yourself, but what I do want to say is that one of our um, stated goals is to, to create one of the great public urban parks in the world. And we argue that great cities have great urban parks. And those admirable cities, no matter which one you choose as your preferred city in the world, you can probably also mention their urban park. So, you know, the most classic New York, in Central Park, although Bryant Park is a more interesting financial story, 
and Millennium Park. And then Texas has several new parks like Warren and Dallas and Discovery Green. Uh, and, and so this connection, this argument that we must invest in our urban parks to help us propel into a certain class is, uh, is an argument that, uh, that we fight for. Next. The guiding principles uh, we, we follow and, and check against every step we take. Uh, the, the guiding principles showed up in our master plan, for instance, regarding connectivity. We ended up reestablishing streets that used to be vehicular before the fair. They were closed for, for the fair, creating a giant cul-de-sac that was very difficult to access and you could only do it as a pedestrian and very long walks. We are reestablishing the historic streets uh, in, in the old right-of-ways to facilitate that connectivity, not only internally, but also recreating the connection to the surrounding areas and neighborhoods. Um, on the example of sustainability, uh, you'll notice that for us that means environmental, but also economic. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about financial uh, sustainability for the park and how we will accomplish that. Next. So here is an area plan. Uh, you see the, uh, the red ribbon is the famous San Antonio River Walk. And uh, just to the east of it, uh, sandwich between downtown and the highway is the fair site, which uh, was mostly used for convention center expansions over time. Uh, the last expansion, which opened just in the last month, allowed for the demolition of the first convention center uh, in the area we call here Northwest Quadrant. And instead of um, a big box building in that area, we are in fact replacing it with park space, allowing us to deliver on a promise to expand the park and improve its quality. The, the project is large, about uh, $700 million all in, including private uh, investment. And for that reason, we have divided it into three phases which here are shown uh, geographically per quadrant. Uh, I'll show you more details in a couple of slides uh, on, on how this is, uh, this is progressing. But the, the first project, the Southwest Quadrant, is uh, Yanaguana Garden. Yanaguana is a Payaya Indian word for spirit waters, which ties back to the river. The Payayas were the Indians, the Native Americans that uh, that lived in this area before the uh, arrival of the Spaniards, and uh, and so there is an honoring to the multiple layers of history and culture that have affected our community. This uh, this uh, rendering is actually pretty accurate to what has been now delivered at Yanaguana Garden. Uh, there are many images, and if you Google Hemisphere or Yanaguana Garden, you see actual pictures. But it uh, it it is a uh, a beautiful environment that is designed for a pre-K to gray uh, audience, meaning that the youngest toddlers will have areas to enjoy. But if you're like me and have a little gray storm, then um, we will have a microbrewery and a, and a coffee bar and bocce and ping pong. So uh, multi-generational enjoyment can be uh, achieved here. We, uh, uh, next slide speaks to uh, the character of Yanaguana Garden and how we have worked to, to uh, uh, differentiate play, play for from, from recreation, uh, and particularly with an interest in uh, cognitive development. Uh, 
Um, and, and we also claim Hemisphere to be where San Antonio meets. So since we opened four months ago, we have 167,000 visitors from every zip code in the city. And so we're able to prove up to our political leadership that uh, there is demand for, for this idea. The next section is the Northwest Quadrant, which is uh, headquartered by the Civic Park. Here, the lawn uh, will hold 12,000 people in concert mode. It's a modified amphitheater that also allows not only accessibility, uh, ADA, but uh, also if you want to play frisbee or kick the ball or whatever is possible here. Next. We are seeking funds now from the next bond election for fund for uh, for the financing we need to to build the park. But you here you see uh, uh, our concern with uh, view corridors in this instance with the Tower of the Americas in in the horizon, and also our intent to build a private mixed use development adjacent to the park, which frame the park provide users of the park by their being uh, upstairs, whether working or living, and uh, and use the amenities that are put in place, not only in the park, but also in the storefronts of, of the buildings. Next. Here is a picture of the Zocalo. Um, we were making progress not only with the design, but also with the private developer Selection under a public-private partnership scenario. Next, I think I talked about all these points here. Next slide. Thank you. Another component to this, I mentioned streets, uh, and to us, it's important that the street be park streets. And so, what is a park street? It does allow vehicular circulation. Next. And uh, but but it is of a certain character that is encouraging of jaywalking. So here is a picture of uh, one of our streets, existing streets, designed for the fair, completely oversized, seven lanes with uh, all kinds of rails. Next slide. It is wide enough to uh, land a uh, a jet on, and this is just a. A scale to show you how crazy sometimes we get on asphalt. Uh, this is how we will change that character uh, into what becomes a boulevard and local access roads uh, on the edge of the park. Next. And the effect that that design has everything from low, uh, low impact development to uh, curbless. Uh, fully accessible uh, shadows, uh, um, on street parking, and heavy canopy. Next. The local access roads are designed also to be convertible into amenities on the edge of the park, so easy to close and then to extend the park. So, uh, here is a little bit on the, the story of, of the finances. Uh, we have various uh, income or revenue streams. Clearly, we need capital from, from the bonds, about $100 million for park streets and historic restoration. Um, a big part of our operating maintenance and activation budget will come from the income from long-term ground leases which the private developer will pay for after they invest about $600 million in mixed-use development on the perimeter of, of, the, um, of the parks. We do have the philanthropic effort. We have created a parking benefit district, a parking enterprise, and we are also uh, coming after historic tax credits and, um, and the tax increment refinance zone. So when you aggregate all those uh, um, income streams, we will be generating about $6.3 million a year in revenue streams that will pay for about $5.6 million of operating 
expenses for part maintenance operation of activation with the promise of coming completely out of the general fund of the city uh, and creating a financial self-sustaining uh, organization and, and parks district. Um, this image just shows, it's, it's pretty complicated to explain here, but the, the darker, I don't know what that color is, brown or gray, are the developable parcels and the light brown, the tan, is all the designated parkland. So here you see the adjacencies uh, between what is developable. Very unusual in the United States to have this uh, parkland not divided from development by a right-of-way as we have in this instance. And so the, the big takeaway for us is everything we do fits in these four categories technical issues of design, construction. Um, we have financial uh, structuring. It's a big part of what we do. Uh, legal requirements, uh, property rights, property designations. We, we went through a legislative action to allow us to clarify uh, parkland uh, real estate. And then the diplomatic part, which I think at the end of the day, it's probably the riskiest part of what we all may be involved in, and I think it's similar to, I'd like to give the example of, of a uh, captain of a sailboat. If you have a, a vision of where to go, if you know where the lighthouse is, it doesn't matter where the wind is coming from. You can get the boat to the lighthouse unless you have a hurricane which sinks your boat. And so or charter is to stay out of hurricanes and no matter where the wind, the political wind comes from, keep on going towards that vision. So that, that concludes my uh, high level thoughts on hemisphere. Thank you. Thank you. I like the, uh, I like the metaphor there with the, uh, with the sailing. Good, good example. So I, I, I think that even though these two case studies are different, they have some similarities um, which seem to uh, suggest that things are changing in parks. And one is this increasing complexity of the job, uh, the building, the managing, the stewarding, maintenance, and the need for partnerships, both, both the private partnerships as well as public. I mean, in both these cases, we're seeing strong partnership with the planning department to accomplish these park goals. Um, second is the role of community engagement and outreach and the thousands of people and meetings and hours that were spent in both of these cases with community members, user groups, to try to figure out how to move forward and what makes sense. Uh, and then, and then lastly, I, I think I heard from both of you guys that having a set of guiding principles or values such as transparency is really important from the outset, particularly when you're working with so many different players. So I have a, a, a number of questions here that have been coming in, and I think what I'm going to do is spend a few minutes uh, talking about Detroit and the Community Benefits Agreement, and then we'll come back to Andre with some questions for him. So there's a kind of a couple questions here, Alicia, that I'm going to try to link together, and maybe you can kind of tell us a little story. One is understanding who ended up uh, being the representative and the spokesperson for the communities in, in, I guess, really the second bridge community benefit agreement effort, the one that actually took shape, um, and who who decided that they would be the spokespeople? How did that work? Um, and then better understanding what kinds of things uh, did the community want, in particular with regard to parks, what kinds of things were they asking for? All right, thank you so much for the question. So basically how it was decided on who would negotiate from the community. I mean, in a number of these communities you mentioned have particular um, associations, black clubs, um, nonprofits that work together. And so they came under, basically developed a consortium um, and decided that um, the, um, one of the leaders of the nonprofit that um, dealt with housing development, that dealt with just um, social equity and improvement for the community would be the leader 
um, to negotiate, and they did the negotiations, of course, with our legislative body, with our city council and the developer, because this is all part of the approval of the project. Um, again, our city council has to approve any transfer of land, any contracts, especially if it's utilized with city funds, in which uh, these particular projects would do impact um, directly to the community or have city funds utilized as well. So that's how the spokespeople were um, kind of identified from the community. Um, if they had some relationship tied to the legislative branch, um, had been very vocal um, and definitely activists um, for that particular community, um, for the Dale Ray community, as well as those individuals um, within the stadium district. And that was a, was a little fragmented. Um, because that one specifically is in our downtown area. So you just really had a conglomerate of residents from a number of the apartments in the area um, and then some businesses. So really their conversation came through our city council um, with impetus into really having the city, um, the community benefits ordinance put in place. So they were, they were trying to formally have an ordinance adopted where it would be obligatory for all of the developers to have a community benefits agreement um, in that stand. And then some of the things that the community was asking for, of course, you know, uh, green spaces, you know, having um, splash pads, of course, picnic amenities, um, some of some um, rock climbing walls, the traditional things that we see, and maybe some of the non-traditional, some of our park improvements, but definitely to have um, some equitable green space in order just to enjoy a you know picnic on the lawn or reading on the lawn, you know, the walking paths, whatever the case may be. So where there were not unrealistic ask um, from the community, um, the, the things that were, I think, that caused greater um, discord was um, the number of jobs that would be available, as well as um, the a number of affordable housing or the amount um, financially that would be um, paid or remunerated to those residents that may have been displaced. That was an issue as well. So it was a culmination of a few things, but what they wanted in the parks to maintain the green space was not a reasonable, but was just one aspect of the overall development project. So Alicia, once it all comes together and, and the plan is determined and everybody's made some compromises and come to agreement, who then will enforce that agreement? And so, and that was the, the one of the questions that we had. And so, it would be, you know, basically an obligation from, again, I think jointly from the administration, mean, you know, the executive branch, as well as the legislative branch, our city council, um, and then those key individuals within the community, and of course, probably a liaison from the developer um, that will work together in order to make sure that you know, those measures or those promises or whatever is to be achieved, what was agreed upon, um, is completed within the prescribed timeline in which was all negotiated and agreed for prior to the approval of the contract. So the contract covers everything, including how, is it, how long it's going to last and who's responsible, and then I'm assuming there's some kind of way to, to track it. Uh, there are people meeting regularly to make sure that the letter of the agreement is being adhered to. Correct. So the, again, that community individual, probably respective individuals from both of the branches, executive and legislative, and definitely, uh, as I indicated, the liaison from the development standpoint, in order, as you said, Kathy, to have that engagement, to find out if they're you know, hitting those earmarks or those targets in which they've discussed, and to make sure that there are language in there, that if there are issues, you know, arbitration and mediation, how do you address those particular steps moving ahead? Andre, you have you know, as much or more complexity in your plan and that you have a lot of players, I mean, a lot of stakeholders here. And one of, one of our participants asked the question, why is there a separate city corporation, one for uh, the real estate owner, and one for for the uh, the developer and the and the operator. Why did the city split those tasks? That's a that's a good question, and it's a, it's a question of uh, legal clarity and also um, uh, a, a little bit of uh, a question of support. When the the, the public facility corporation uh, that is actually. Uh, the, the board of directors of that organization is the city council. 
but in San Antonio Council is divided geographically into 10 districts. The hemisphere PFC is exclusive to hemisphere issues and that allows us to talk to council not in the individually as concerns leaders of various districts but on the subject of hemisphere which is a, uh, considered a citywide project even though it's located in the downtown district one. Um, there is also a, a legality in regards to a generation of revenues on property owned by the city and by having it in the PFC it allows then uh, certain mechanisms like the creation of the TIF is facilitated um, also uh, public uh, incentives and and the incorporation of a workforce housing policy into the equation that ensures affordability within the district without becoming a housing authority federal driven uh, voucher program uh, so it's workforce versus affordable um, and then the PFC in turn is or landlord we have an agreement not with the city uh, because the city has transferred the property to the PFC uh, under which authority under that organization they can they can create these uh, uh, agreements and, um, and and so the PFCs or landlord and we've entered into a, a 99 year lease for the developable parcels while keeping the park property within the city's uh, domain so that remains a, uh, a public uh, uh, property but it permits us to enter into operating agreements and, um, and, and agreements to lease and sublease the historic homes in which, in, in which the, we are placing park activating tenants like cafes and, and restaurants, galleries. That, that answers another uh, of a series of questions that have come in about the relationship between uh, creating these new parks and creating affordable housing. I mean, it sounds like the combination of these two public corporations, you're, you're really managing that property. If it's as successful as you hope it will be, there is, you know, the chance that the real estate values will rise so much to drive people out. But it sounds like you all have planned some, some controls for that to keep a, a mixed income group living around the parks. That's correct. The, the workforce housing policy requires all developers on, on, our, on, our, on our properties to incorporate 10% minimum, 50% maximum of the units in each development to fit into an income scale of 50% to 110% of the area median income. So basically what I'm saying is that 2% of the units because our median income is roughly, say, $45,000 a year in San Antonio, that there will be 2% of the unit at $600 per month. And then on a scale that um, goes to 50% of AMI, 60, 70, up to 110%. Uh, it, it's critical that affordability be kept in the equation because this is a public good project and it cannot become simply a, a, a luxury uh, development. And I, and I echo Andreas' um, sentiment with that, and, and although I don't know the specific figures, I do know through our planning development department and our housing rehabilitation services department, there are, for, for any of developers, a percentage of you know, housing um, that has to let, uh, resolve at low or moderate income again based on just our demographics and the needs you know for our community um, in order as you said that it's not totally displacing a community or a neighborhood but still that they're able to participate in the renovations or the new uh, infrastructure of the apartments or housing um, but also that the developer is able to recoup some of their financial um, investment for that so it, we do the same in Detroit as well Let's talk for a minute in both cities about 
uh, again, all of these different partners. So you have some, in the case of the community benefit agreement, you have some advocates who come to the table to advocate the agreement. You often have uh, friends of the parks who are advocates. Uh, but then you have uh, sort of conservancies, uh, groups that are more there to be fundraisers, like the Hemispheric Conservancy. Can, can you talk a little bit about how to how, to, how they separate themselves in some ways. Uh, there's some questions about how a conservancy uh, can grow and get credibility in the face of an existing Friends of the Park group. Uh, there's some questions about why the conservancy in San Antonio was separated from the Public Benefit Corporation. Maybe, uh, Andre, why don't you start and then I'll come, come back to you too, Alicia. That's a tough question, but it's a really good one, and we've struggled. When, when, we, when we created the local government corporation, we uh, went after and received the 501c3 designation. We began to attempt to fundraise, but because our uh, vision and purpose included private mixed-use development that would generate revenues, no matter what it's used, the, the use of those revenues is to pay for park operations and activation, but that didn't matter to the philanthropic community. We were, uh, our hands were directly and indirectly related to the private sector development interests in the area surrounding the parks. And so, um, in in 14, we just said it, it's just not going to work. We, we were getting too many doors shut because of that relationship, and that's when we stood up a, the conservancy as a completely standalone, completely away from the city. Uh, it, it, the local government corporation is not completely away because our board is designated by the mayor, and and the mayor can dismiss the board members, and because of that. Our board has to be very polite, and uh, you know, so so there is a degree of control that is brought to into organization by the city by the way that we're set up. On the other hand, the conservancy, completely separate from us and the city, uh, they have their own private board, and that particular board is a group of individuals that are experts and experienced in. Uh, philanthropic fundraising, uh, as opposed to my board, which is a technical board of financiers and real estate developers and design professionals. So that's partly how we got here through a series of lessons learned of things that didn't quite work when we started. So what, what about Detroit? Where's that line between sort of friends of the park and the advocates who come to the table and then longer term, those folks who can raise money and help you steward those parks? Oh, you know, of course we have both. We have a number of friends groups, and, and then I was involved with actually um, the creation of the um, Bell Isle Conservancy uh, when I was the Bell Isle manager. So again, you know, and what that did, and let me use that example of the Belle Isle Conservancy, because there were a number of friends of groups within Belle Isle's operation. So we had a Friends of the Aquarium, uh, the Friends of Belle Isle, the Friends of um, the Botanical Society, and so all, and the Friends of the Zoo. So what 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 took place was just basically. Um, a, 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 a decommission, if I can say, of the other groups, and they came under one umbrella as a conservancy and developed a conservancy. So all of the interests would come um, as that one voice. Because um, what you had, of course, with you different friends groups, you would have, you know, aspects of competing requests for fundraising um, and other, you know, philanthropic support. And so under that one umbrella, it just gave them, I guess, some additional credibility in which they were able to work with us in developing strategic planning for the park um, to assist with marketing, um, as well as um, help fundraise for particular identified agreed upon priorities for park improvements or programming. And so that's how that worked um, with the um, Bell Isle Conservancy. And we have a number of other conservancy groups, our Detroit Riverfront Conservancy which um, 
operates and manages a portion of the riverfront property, which a large amount of it was the City of Detroit Parks and Recreation Inventory. So they are responsible for the complete fundraising, um, the complete programming, um, improvements, um, marketing, all of that aspect they're responsible for. Of course, they have some level of approval that has to be received from the city since it is still city-owned property. And conversely, then we have our friends of group, um, our grassroots group, with our, which are very valuable as well, and just serve as eyes and ears, advocates um, within the community um, to help um, with conservation, um, to help you know secure grants for some some park improvements. Um, as well, so you know they both have you know um, equal value. Um, the conservancy definitely has more, I guess, footing when it's trying to get the philanthropic and other funding sources signed on. And so you know when we have an existing friends of group and establishing a conservancy, what what we've tried to do is kind of shepherd it all under the umbrella of the conservancy, and where the interests are all kind of same, but within that special niche niche of, of what the individual or the, what that particular friends or group um, had an interest in. One more very quick question because I know we're running out of time, but you're both describing places where the private-public partnership has been kind of on steroids. I mean, you're taking it to a, a much uh, further place in a lot of other cities. Can you each just take a few seconds and tell me what does it take for a city parks department um, and Alicia, you're on the inside, to adapt its culture to form these kind of partnerships. What kind of recommendations can you give folks about working with their parks department to move in this direction of a much, much stronger private partners? I know for, for me and the experience that we had is that you definitely have to um, remove uh, the territory um, barriers um, and thinking, you know, the I and, and, and kind of take over control. I think what both parties need to come and realize is the benefit of having the public-private partnership of showing the aspects on how they can improve the use of, in our instance of the green space overall, while still, you know, supporting the city's overall vision opposed to, and we do have instances where we have individuals or conservancies that have control over the programming, control over the management, but they still have to receive city support from certain aspects of improvements or capital um, design changes. Um, but I, I think the first thing is that, again, it would be the same with the CBAs of being transparent, definitely removing the territory barriers that we can't do it alone. And so we're going to need the assistance and then having the open dialogue to what the conservancy would like to achieve and what the city or the particular municipality would like to achieve in their vision um, in order to make sure that those goals from the conservancy align with the city's vision. And again, um, because it is city-owned property, of course, that would take the lead, but not that you're not open and be open to other recommendations and, and, and suggestions in order to improve programming or the infrastructure of your parks for the community. Andre, anything to add to that? In, in San Antonio, we, uh, we do have a, an agreement with Parks and Rec, and the, the way we started the conversation is with the creation of a matrix of responsibility, clarity about who is responsible for what was critical. And, um, and, and clearly the city is, uh, is got uh, substantial resources because of the infrastructure base, not only staff but equipment and expertise and maintenance and, and, and uh, operate, activation, excuse me, maintenance, uh, horticulture, uh, and access to plumbers, electricians, and other uh, experts that are required from time to time at the park. So uh, here we ended up splitting where we are leading all of the activation and the park is uh, uh, maintaining uh, the, the park itself. And, and, and one of the challenges was that while we are on site full time and our activation, let's say, director is 24-7 uh, is, is almost, um, parks may be more uh, temporary. They they have a schedule. They come in. They do cleaning, and um, uh, but but my staff cannot direct city staff because of uh, civil servant rules, 
and uh, um, and so it's a it's a true collaboration, and it's also a a, a financial distribution uh, according to uh, to responsibilities. So it takes a lot of work and collaboration to to come together and to begin to deliver seamlessly down to uniforms and that kind of detail. Well, it sounds like both both cities are doing that, and your stories are terrific. And I know I've kept everybody a little longer, but thank you to our presenters again. Thank you to those who sent thoughtful questions. Uh, as you saw quickly with the slides, I want to remind you to pencil in on your calendar that the City Parks Alliance next conference is in Minneapolis in uh, the summer of 2017. Also, we have a new feature on our website called Park Exchange. If you haven't discovered that, it has a host of documents, agreements, MOUs to help you better understand best practice around partnership agreement. Uh, the catch is you have to be a CPA member to get access. So for those of you who are already members, thank you for your participation in this webinar and making CPA a success. Uh, if you're not a member, we hope that you'll take a minute to join. It's a terrific organization with a lot of resources. Uh, you're going to receive a copy of this uh, webinar, uh, a PDF after the the uh, webinar is over, and you'll also receive a short survey uh, that we hope you'll fill out. We want your feedback, any suggestions about how we can improve the webinar. So thank you all very much. Um, and uh, if you're not a member of City Parks, please join. And as always, keep up the great work you're doing out there. And thanks for joining us. Thank you.